I'm in a room which seems to be one of the quietest rooms I've ever been in. There's no echo. All the sound seems to lose itself in a depth of silence, absorbed by the heavy curtains and the deep pile carpet and the bookshelves lined with yards and yards of leather-bound volumes. The room is a study at one end of a double drawing room in a spacious early 20th century villa in North London, 20 Maresfield Gardens. It was the home for about a year at the very end of his life of the man who a hundred years ago coined the term psychoanalysis. In the centre of the room there's a desk with a couple of dozen figurines ranged along its outer edge. Little Egyptian statuettes, Chinese figures of carved jade, miniature gods from classical Greece and Rome. Beyond the figurines, against the far wall, there's a couch covered with a Persian carpet. It's probably the most famous bit of furniture of the 20th century, the original analyst's couch, where the patients of Sigmund Freud were invited to lie down, make themselves comfortable, and by saying whatever came into their heads, indicate to him their innermost thoughts. Anyone who comes as a visitor can find all sorts of different things here. Freud's London home is now the Freud Museum. Its curator is Erica Davis. Yes, for some it's a shrine, that's undoubtedly true. But the person who visits the museum, I personally would like to get some insight into the Freud the man. A man with a great depth of reading of literature. A good proportion of the books in this study are of his, his literary leanings, his archaeological leanings, his interest in art. Um, you get a sense of his passionate interest in the ancient world as you look round at these cases which are filled full of Greek terracottas, Egyptian amulets, statues. And so you, you see an immensely cultivated, uh, immensely well-read person. But in addition to all this learning and scholarship, Sigmund Freud was a brilliant self-publicist. He worked tirelessly to promote the technique which he founded, psychoanalysis, as a means of understanding human behaviour. He called it the thread through the labyrinth. If he'd lived a few decades later, he would undoubtedly have used the medium of broadcasting to promote his theories. As it is, there's only one recording of his voice in the BBC archive. It dates from 1938, just a year or so before he died. The recording is crackly, Freud had difficulty speaking because of cancer of the jaw, but even so, it gives what might be called the authorised version of his career. I started my professional activity as a neurologist trying to bring relief... I started my professional activity as a neurologist trying to bring relief to my neurotic patients. I discovered some important new facts about the unconscious in psychic life and the role of instinctual urges and so on. In psychic life, the role of instinctual urges and so on. Sigmund Freud was born in 1856 into a Jewish merchant family in the province of Moravia, which was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. As a young child, he moved with his family to Vienna, the imperial capital, in the 1880s, he trained as a neurologist, studying the structure of the brain and the way it affects mental behaviour, that is, the way people think and feel and conduct themselves. Until then, it had been assumed by most doctors that all mental disorders had physical causes and were due to the brain malfunctioning as a physical organ of the body. For a time, Freud used hypnotism to treat what he described as neuroses. These were mental disorders which were not as extreme as insanity, but which nevertheless prevented people from leading a normal life. Obsessions, anxieties, nightmares, depressions, even paralysis of parts of the body. Freud came to believe that these kinds of conditions might often be due not to any physical problem in the brain, but to an imbalance of emotions, caused perhaps by startling or worrying events in early life. Almost every neurosis, he argued, could be traced back to a traumatic early experience which inflicted a sort of mental wound. He developed a technique for dealing with these conditions, a technique which one of his early patients described as the talking cure. And as Michael Molnar, research director of the Freud Museum, explains, the couch on which Freud's patients relaxed and talked about themselves took centre stage in the consulting room. By stages, he came onto 
a new treatment uh, without hypnotism, which involved the patient talking of their trouble. This doesn't sound very revolutionary in itself, and yet it is the first time that we have the doctor actually listening to the patient. And it was accepted that the patient had to be visible, had to display their disorders, but not talk about them. Their talk was not valued. So for the first time, we find a therapist listening carefully to the patient's utterances. Out of these findings grew out of the findings grew a new science, psychoanalysis, a part of psychology, and a new method of treatment of the neurosis. Method of treatment of the neurosis. The treatment came to be known as psychoanalysis, a term which Freud first used in 1896. Like many of his phrases, it had a ring to it, but it was controversial because it laid claim to a basic scientific procedure. It suggested that the analysis of a patient's mental and emotional state, which was often confused and trying to suppress traumatic memories, could be conducted in the same way as a laboratory analysis. Just as a lab technician can break down a substance into its component parts using the proven laws of physics and chemistry, so the analyst, said Freud, could use the symbols of his patient's dreams and mental images to reveal the true causes of mental distress. At the heart of his theories was the belief that unconscious forces affect the way we behave, as Erica Davis explains. Freud believed that not all our actions are rationally based, that in fact we have an unconscious which affects a lot of our activities irrationally. He broke the, the unconscious down into a number of areas. The id, which seeks satisfaction, the sort of primitive force, the ego, which is the part that mediates with the outside world, the civilizing force, as it were, and then the superego, or what you might crudely describe as the conscience. And these elements he saw battling with each other. A lot of what happened to people he saw as happening in early childhood, and one of these critical phases of childhood he described as the Oedipus phase, where he saw children as having a sexual element whereby a child was attracted to the parent of the opposite sex and wished to have removed the parent of the same sex. And these were some of the more contentious of his theories, this discovery of infantile sexuality, but which is very central to the whole notion of psychoanalysis today. And does a modern-day psychoanalyst like Earl Hopper, an American working in London, still apply Freud's theories? I do. It would be very difficult for me to imagine how any psychoanalyst could work without applying Freud's theories. Understanding symbolic processes, understanding unconscious processes, the understanding of the way in which a tragic early trauma that uh, has not been worked through or understood by a person unconsciously gets repeated in the treatment situation. Yes, I, I apply his theories constantly, all the time. Got to remember that many people, when they say Freud, they simply mean somehow vague notions of sexuality or infantile sexuality. So a Freudian is one who, who sees sex every place. What Freud meant by sex, and what I would mean by sex in this sense, is that it really is a, the life force. An infant at the breast is actually having what we would call a sexual experience, a, a, a living life experience of desire, so that the life force is uh, something to be understood in terms of the phases that people go through from conception to death. The story of Sigmund Freud's career in the early 20th century has strong dramatic overtones. It's not the kind of drama that arises from vivid action or sudden events. Freud spent most of his time working in his study or his consulting rooms in the Bergasse, a street lined with typical Viennese apartment blocks near the old city centre. It's contrast which provides the drama in Freud's career. The contrast between his theory that all human behaviour has a sexual motive and the prim and proper standards of the Viennese middle class to which he belonged. 
According to Freud, the polite conversation of the Viennese coffee houses was just a thin veneer above unconscious thoughts of incest, rape and violent desire, while the crowds applauding the emperor in his carriage were swayed by hidden instincts of murder, jealousy and rage. Freud was happy to play up the drama. We are not the masters of our own house, he once said, and to present himself as an intellectual revolutionary. People did not believe in my facts and thought my theories unsavory. People did not believe in my facts and thought my theories unsavory. Resistance was strong and unrelenting. In the end, I succeeded in acquiring pupils and building up an international psychoanalytic association. An international psychoanalytic association. Until recently, the authorised version of Freud's career has gone largely unchallenged. Today, however, there's a growing revisionist school of writers on Freud. Researchers who have gone back to the period when he was formulating his ideas and have looked again at some of the case histories on which he based his theory of psychoanalysis. Alan Esterson is the author of a book called Seductive Mirage, in which he suggests that Freud might not have been altogether truthful in his accounts of his early studies. I'm saying he was misrepresenting clinical evidence. I think he had the notion that he had discovered a technique for divining the contents of a person's unconscious. In actuality, it was a technique which enabled him to find whatever he had decided in advance because his interpretive technique was so elastic that while he was interpreting dreams or symptoms or associations of patients, he would always make sure it fitted whatever theory he held at the time. There are certainly times when he must have known he was making statements which were not true, such as when he claimed that Anna O, one of the original early cases of psychoanalysis, was a complete therapeutic success when we know he knew that it was not true. Now, no doubt he did this for the greater good of psychoanalysis, for this greater truth, but it does indicate that there was not only self-deception there, but he was also deceiving his readers. Freud's readers, in the first instance, were the subscribers to the specialist medical journals in which he published his case histories. But gradually, he acquired a popular following, helped by the publication at the dawn of the new century of his book, The Interpretation of Dreams. Dreams, he wrote, are the royal roads to the unconscious. It could have been the slogan for much of the art of the early 20th century. The expressionists, the surrealists, painters and writers across Europe in the years before and after the First World War were strongly influenced by Freud. His reputation was helped, too, by the dramatic code names which he attached to his patients when he published their case histories. Little Hans was a child with a phobia about horses. The Rat Man was terrified of being eaten by rodents. The Wolf Man was a depressive who had a recurring dream about a tree filled with wolves. The mental condition of each of these patients was set out in a case history, like the plot of a detective novel. And each one ended with Freud, like Sherlock Holmes, solving the case with an interpretation that was invariably sexual in origin. But according to Alan Esterson, Freud was not above helping the plot along. One piece of research by a Freudian writer, which was on the Ratman case, which is the only case for which we have any of the original case notes, found that Freud had changed uh, the chronology of some of the material, he changed the time scale, he'd organised the writing up of the paper to make it seemed as if his theories came out naturally from the information he got from his patients, when in fact, very early on, it was he who'd put forward the notions and, as usual with his case histories, ensured that his patients always came up, or the material they came up with could always be interpreted in terms of his preconceived notions. In the last two or three decades, all these arguments have come to the fore now. There have been an immense number of challenges on all aspects of Freud's theories. But even before that, there were challenges to Freud from within his own circle, which included analysts like Alfred Adler, Wilhelm Steckel and Carl Gustav Jung. One by one, they disputed aspects of his theories. One by one, Freud fell out with all of them. It's yet another striking contrast in the story of Sigmund Freud, the contrast between his claim to scientific objectivity and the personal bitterness 
with which he parted company with most of his early collaborators. Generally, however, Freud kept his personal and his professional lives separate, although the apartment in the Bergasse was the setting for them both, as Freud's grandson, Anton Walter Freud, told me. Well, he had two courts, grandfather. A normal emperor only has one court, but grandfather had two. There was the professional court with all the analysts, and then there was a private court with his family and his friends. And I think it was only his younger daughter, Anna, Anna Freud, who shared, who was sitting, so to speak, or had the entrance to two courts. In addition to Anna Freud, who became a well-known psychoanalyst herself, Freud and his wife Martha had five other children. Most of them lived with their children near the Bergasse, and in the 1920s and 30s, before the rise of Nazism, life for three generations of the Freud family consisted of a series of social rituals. During these years, Freud's writings expanded beyond psychoanalysis to take in anthropology and religion, and as an old man, one might almost see him as a subject of the ancestor worship, which he described in his writings. While we were in Vienna, it was family tradition to visit him on the Sunday lunchtime to pay our respects. And it was, uh, the, it was almost to the second, grandfather came in, and from the other dog, the maid came in with the soup, and on the dotted one, he had his meal, and at two o'clock he would go back don't forget that grandfather at that time uh, was terribly ill. He suffered from cancer in the mouth and had great difficulties eating and even speaking was hurtful. In 1938 came the Anschluss, the Nazi annexation of Austria. Psychoanalysis was attacked as a so-called Jewish science, destructive of family and social values. The Freud family left the apartment which had for so long been the centre of their life. They came to London, where he bought the house in Maresfield Gardens. And there, in the last year of his life, he contemplated a world where his views of the basic irrationality of human behaviour seemed to have been confirmed by Europe's descent into tribalism, intolerance and chaos. He died just after the outbreak of war in 1939. Almost 60 years on, the atmosphere of his London home is that of a high-class design centre. In the museum shop, cufflinks are on sale, decorated with a motif based on one of Freud's doodles. Visitors from all over the world can be found whispering in front of Khmer statuettes and Greek deities and jackal-headed gods from ancient Egypt. And in the study, there is the symbol of psychoanalysis itself, Freud's famous analyst's couch, draped with its opulent Persian rug, where Anna O, oh, Little Hans, the Rat Man and the Wolf Man lay down and talked of their troubles. The artist Celia Reed recently depicted the contents of Freud's study in a series of paintings which addressed the actual process of psychoanalysis itself. I looked for ways to do that and of course a very good starting point was the couch and also the collection of objects in Freud's study and he collected figurines in the cultures that produced them, they symbolised the things that he had come to understand through a different route, through psychoanalysis. But it's as if the gods and goddesses and the heroic figures of, from antiquity portrayed in, the, in their lives the very things that go on in the unconscious. And I think that's why Freud had them in his co and collected them. And so I was able to use them in my work to symbolise the things that were going on. But also I then moved on to see how the very medium of painting could be used to give an equivalence to the experience of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, although it's partly about intellectual understanding, is largely about emotional understanding and change and development. And so Paint is a very good medium for moving us by through the use of colour and form, rhythm, movement. The international visitors who come to the Freud Museum reflect a continuing fascination with Freud's belief that human beings in all cultures share a basic inner structure. The International Psychoanalytic Association, which Freud was so proud of establishing, now has members in every continent of the world. Its president, Horatio Echigoyen, is an Argentinian, 
He sees psychoanalysis as a kind of lubricant, helping the frictions of society, but he's cautious about predicting its future development. I think that psychoanalysis is like a drop of oil, which spreads all over the world in a very idiosyncratic way. You cannot suppose in advance which will be the next development. Freud's idea that the human being has an instinctive structure which is most determinant in his behavior or her behavior, I think is a, a very important point in psychoanalysis. But can the theories of Freud, the Central European, really be applied in the very different societies of Africa or India or Asia? Of course, the social environment is completely important. But the main problems of man are just the same in Africa or in Europe or Latin America. For instance, the relation with children, with parents, husband and woman, they are still there. But it was in America that Freud's theories achieved their greatest influence. In places like New York City, psychoanalysis acquired the status of an urban cult. For the American analyst, Earl Hopper, this can be directly linked with the wave of Jewish refugees who left Europe in the 1930s. Many went directly to the United States, particularly New York, so that in Manhattan there was really a community of psychoanalysts who were able to build an intellectual psychoanalytical culture that became almost synonymous with urban middle-class refugee culture. Uh, and uh, psychoanalysis became part of a way of life of uh, immigrants. Every educated person had to read Freud and many had to have an analysis. It'd be like going to Europe for a summer or so after university. You'd have some analysis in New York. It was just part of maturation. And the familiar became comical. The comedian Woody Allen made his career as the symbol of anxious, self-absorbed Freudian man. I was in analysis. You should know that about me. That's, I was in group analysis when I was younger. So I couldn't afford private. Last year I had difficulty with my income tax. I tried to take my analyst off as a business deduction. You know. The government said that it was entertainment. You know. <laughs> We compromised finally and made it a religious contribution. <laughs> but fashions change. The statues of the gods are toppled. Nowadays, it's in America that some of the most vociferous challenges are being made both to Freud's reputation and to the technique that he established. Hagiography, a 20th century cargo cult, a con trick, psychobabble. These are some of the charges that have been levelled against psychoanalysis and its founder. A few months ago, there were protests when the Library of Congress in Washington, which houses many of Freud's papers, announced that it was planning a special exhibition on Freud. The protesters claimed that the revisionist view of Freud should be represented, and the exhibition has now been postponed until 1998. Alan Esterson believes this scepticism about psychoanalysis is rooted in the new research into its founders' working methods. I think we're entering a special phase of Freud criticism. There has been criticism over the years, really throughout this century. But for the last two or three decades, there's been so much research that a large body of scholars are now embarking on the kind of Freud criticism which will not simply go away. My view is that within the next generation, this will have a strong effect, that there will be changes in the textbooks, and that a very different picture of Freud will emerge in the next century. But even if Sigmund Freud did cut corners in his working methods a century or so ago, does this necessarily mean that the technique he founded is itself no longer valid? I think it does, partly because all psychoanalysts would have gone through five years of training in which, to a considerable extent, they will have accepted Freud's notions and the basic ideas which are supposed to underlie neuroses. And, and even if they have followed up different schools, like the school of Melanie Klein or Anna Freud, or whatever alternative, and there are a great many alternatives nowadays, they essentially base their notions on similar ideas, methods of free association, and they all tend to find within their patients corroborating evidence for their own particular ideas. The terms in which psychoanalytic theory is couched are such that an analyst can come up with an explanation of virtually anything that happens to anybody. 
On the other hand, Earl Hopper continues to practice the broad remit of psychoanalysis as the talking cure that Freud advocated a hundred years ago. He's not surprised that with the discovery of new drugs and with recent advances in genetics and biochemistry, there should be challenges from within the medical establishment to Freud's claim to have founded a new science. They regard it as insufficiently scientific, that many of the insights are regarded as essentially literary. The idea that a neurosis should have a particular meaning in symbolic terms is regarded almost as, an, as something that a novelist or a good short story writer you, you know, could tell about doesn't seem very scientific. And modern medicine uh, has rediscovered psychoanalysis as a kind of scapegoat, my guess is, for a degree of helplessness which besets modern psychiatry too. Many of us don't know what to do, really, with mental illness. It's still an area of problem. Many studies indicate that people get minimal, they get some help, but minimal help from drugs. Certainly some of the uh, affective disorders, depression, certain types of schizophrenia, uh, respond very well to modern drugs. They can be contained. The worried well, the traumatized, uh, people who have suffered massive social dislocations, they develop the sort of problems uh, which benefit from having somebody to talk to, and to talk to in a particular way, not just an agony ant, Somebody who will understand how their lives are being recreated in symbolic form and the symptoms they have. I think it's very important that someone who's got emotional problems, I think it's very important that they should be talking, psychotherapy in the talking sense. What I'm concerned about is the kind of talking that goes on rather than that they should be talking. Alan Esterson. As for Freud himself, well, I can't help feeling that the old self-publicist might have been secretly gratified at the continued attention his theories are getting. It is, after all, entirely consistent with his authorised version. Resistance was drunk and unrelenting. Resistance continues to be strong and unrelenting. For Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, and for its practitioners a hundred years later, the struggle is not yet over. But the struggle is not yet over. Sigmund Freud 